Good evening. My name is Minjung Gafri. I run Will Forge for Food with my best friend Rachel Mifsud. So Mifsud is not my name, but that's my best friend's name. She made this beautiful presentation that I use for other presentations as well. So uh, Will Forge for Food teaches people how to identify plants for edible, medicinal, or otherwise useful um, uses. And um, we host a um, variety of summer camps, like mushroom camps. We have <coughs> largest Midwest summer gathering of foragers um, during June. It's coming up next year. And um, yeah, since I went back to school, she's teaching a lot of classes now. So during the winter time, she does few plant walks and sometimes do um, uh, like first aid foraged medicinal cabinet type of classes. So today I'm going to talk about what foraging is, how you can start, and what the benefits are. How many of you are gardeners? All right, all, most of you. <laughs> Great. So I'm pretty sure you know a lot of plants already. And I'm pretty sure if, if you're not, you're here because you're interested in learning more about some use, you know, different usages of, say, weeds. Not dead weeds, but you know, the ones you pull out. So this is a picture of foods that Rachel and George gathered within, I believe, two or three hours. That's basket of apple, feral pear, hazelnut. I believe that's butternut and hop. Um, I cannot see what's in the other side of the box, but there are some mushrooms as well. So you can see the more you know, the more you can gather in short period of time. So I'll talk more about that as we go. So why do we forage or why do I forage? I come from South Korea. So I grew up with a culture where everybody goes out foraging throughout the season. In the springtime, we go out, forage, shepherd's purse, mugwort, all other shoots and greens. Um, a lot of things are ubiquitous like dandelion, purslane. Purslane is more summer, but um, or lamb's quarter. So these things I grew up with in summertime, not much, but in the fall time, I remember gathering persimmon, chestnut, and acorns, stuff like that. And when I came to the US 15 years ago, there was literally nobody doing what I was doing or anybody heard of it until I met her a few years ago. So at the time I met my at the time boyfriend, now husband, we went out and I recognized this. Oh, I know this. It's edible. And when I'm about to pick it, he was like, don't touch it. You're going to get in trouble. That's the general attitude I got from other people as well. So why do I forage? It's first of all free. So there's a little story. Um, so my mother-in-law is really generous lady, really nice lady. But when I told her, I finally got back into foraging with my friend. Her first response was, oh, do you need grocery money? But you know, it's not that I need grocery money or just because it's free, but it's other whole variety of reasons. But first and foremost, it's free. Well, if you're hunting, then you have to pay for licenses and other stuff. But um, for plants, as long as it's from your garden, in addition to your garden stuff, it's free. If you go out for hiking, if you get some food as well, it's free. And it's also fresh, it's also seasonal. You only get plants, edible plants, when it's, when it's available during the season. Um, we're gonna talk about the season a little bit on the back of the sheet. So it's also organic. Nobody sprays out there unless you're looking at city parks. Like I'm urban forager. I live in Detroit, and there's a lot of spraying and other car pollutions going on. But otherwise, it's organic. Nobody is spraying pesticides or using chemical fertilizer or anything. It's all free out there. It's fresh. It's organic. And you also get it from local. Well, I travel a little north to get some other stuff that I cannot get. For example, we have a tea in the back today. It, it is made out of wintergreen and sassafras roots. 
Um, Wintergreen doesn't grow in general in this area. I know there are gardener friends who kind of transplanted it uh, successfully, but it, in general, it's a northern crop. So I have to travel at least two, three hours north to get um, wintergreen leaves. Also, sassafras is actually southern species, and Michigan is kind of its northern boundary, so to speak. And it's kind of going up because the climate's getting warmer. But um, those two are the ingredients in the tea, and I have two jars of the ingredients, so you can actually smell it. It's really good. So it's local. It comes from, like, literally from your territory. So let me talk a little bit about ter ter territory. For foragers, it's important to have territory so that you know when you go somewhere, it's not totally new. Oh, yeah, it's exciting. There are new plants. And you go out and start looking around all good. But then if you're not going to come back, <laughs> it's really not your food source, right? Besides, plants have cycle. In the springtime, you tap the tree, so you get may maybe you get maybe maple, maple syrup, or sometimes you can tap birch tree as well, or any poplar trees. Um, also, after sap season, it's it, the buds come out, so there are some edible buds or medicinal buds, and then after that, it's shoots and greens, little young green season, and then after that, flower comes out, and then after that, seeds and nuts and fruits and all that yummy stuff. And then it goes into root season until next, next spring. So we have this cycle. So for, uh, in order to access free foods in season, you need to know your territory, what plants grow there, when it's harvestable, and you know, what's accessible. Like, is it in the thickets of the wood? Is it growing along the trail? Or is it growing in your garden most of the time? So, so that's what locality means. So build your territory, starting from your garden. Maybe go a little out and then try some public parks, and then go out on a hiking trail and see what's going, growing there. And then from there, you can build your territory. So it's also fun. To me, it's fun <laughs> activity. I go out, I go out because, mostly because I go, I go out with friends and we know a lot of plants, and together we can gather a lot of food. And it's fun to gather something edible, useful together. Um, one of my other foraging instructor friend in Traverse City, his name is Clay, and he does foraging walks too, but he's more like foraging hike. You will walk like, I don't know, go three, four miles in two hours or something like that. I rarely walk one mile within an hour, hour and a half. So, there is a little bit of um, difference between what fun is defined, but yeah. So it's fun activity. You can go out and get some exercise as well. Um, of course, it requires some squatting down. If you're a gardener, you're familiar with all the gardening. So it's not that intensive. It's just a little bit of exercise. And then taste is much better when you get wild food. Um, <coughs> How can I say this? It's more intense. So lamb's quarter, also known as goose food, also known as kinopodium. Um, how many of you know lamb's quarter? Yay. So it, it is related to spinach. And it has very mild taste to it. And it's edible. Um, it's edible from when it's just coming out to when it's, uh, it, 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 when it, yeah. I don't need flowers, but just before flowering, that's the green season. And then you can also eat the seeds. Seeds are a bit soapy, so I would rather have it as a microgreen after, you know, get the shoots out. But um, so lamb's quarter is relative to spinach, but it has more intense nutrients than spinach. Like, I don't know, I don't know exact numbers, but the calcium and all these micronutrients are much richer than spinaches you get from market. Um, purslane is also very nutrient-rich food. So feral apples are hit or miss, but you know usually it's smaller and it has more intense flavor than store-bought uh, apples. 
So the taste is much better in terms of um, wild food. Uh, I cannot really describe it unless I hear it, taste it, and you know, unless I give it to you, and then you will experience how richer the flavor is. And for example, how many of you had burdock before? I know they sell it now. Okay, one person. So burdock is also edible. It's an um, invasive species in Michigan, but the roots are edible. As far as I know, in the entire world, Koreans and Japanese are the only two <laughs> at, uh, people who eat burdock root. But the burdock root is edible. You can get it here from market, but also you can get, you know, if you forage or if you know how to identify it, it probably grows in any public park or possibly in your garden if you ever seen any no you don't think so okay so burdock tastes a bit sweet i cannot compare it to any other vegetable so burdock tastes like burdock so that's the one difficult side of um, foraging and when people ask oh so how does that taste like it tastes like burdock, you know. <laughs> I, I, kinopodium is a bit easier because I can say, oh, it's relative to spinach and it's like mild green like spinach. It, I can compare those two, but like for example, burdock, I cannot really say how it tastes like. And sassafras and <clears throat> uh, wintergreen that I have in the bag, you're probably familiar with the wintergreen taste, like um, Altoid wintergreen. <clears throat> That's where the wintergreen taste is, flavor come from. Also sassafras roots are traditionally used in root beer. So the, they use now um, artificial flavor, but root beer flavor actually come from sassafras. So those two flavors you may recognize, but the taste is really intense. <coughs> you need to try. So other thing, relaxation. Well, like I said, clay does foraging hike, so I wouldn't say that's relaxing activity, but for me, going out foraging is just walking off the trail, going into the woods, and then take some time to look around and, you know, to see what's going on during this season and enjoying the nature. So that's kind of relaxing activity. And mushroom hunting is a bit different because <laughs> My mom believes mushroom hunters are the most miserable people on earth because mushroom pops up after rain. So when, when it's favorable for a mushroom, it is always wet and soggy outside. So mushroom hunting is a bit different. I, I wouldn't say that's relaxing. <coughs> and um, the variety, I think I mentioned, um, there are a variety of um, foods you can get from wild that you cannot otherwise get from grocery store. Like purslane, I, I think, some ethnic stores sell purslane because it's ubiquitous and some cultures do eat purslane as a vegetable. Dandelion they started to sell, chicory they started to sell, but there are other variety of stuff that they don't sell. Like kinopodium, I don't know why they don't sell <laughs> lamb's quarter because it's abundant, it's all over, it's weedy, and you know, it tastes great to me. It's oh, lamb's quarter, oh, yes or kinopodium, or goosefoot. Those are the three <coughs> common names. And the last part is security. Food security is something that is kind of in my mind because of the climate change and a lot of crops come from south or California mostly actually. And whenever there's wildfire or when there's drought, the crop fluctuates, right? And this year we had some weird climate, so some, the, the cold hit really early before the crop actually matured when they, uh, so that kind of things, because of that, we are very dependent on the market and the food security part is that knowing your local plants, what's useful, like edible, medicinal, or otherwise useful plants, you have that much power on you. Like gardening is one side of it and by foraging, you get other foods that you are not otherwise getting that's local, mostly native, eh, okay, some invasive, but mostly local native plants. So that's top 10 reasons. So is foraging really practical? Like I said, foraging is in general, in, in a smaller sense, it's getting foods from surroundings, from the environment 
But for, for, for a larger definition, foraging is getting, like I said, food medicinal or otherwise useful items from your surroundings, which includes hunting in a larger sense. So, I mean, like I said, hunting costs money, gardening costs money, and foraging, of course, you have to drive to somewhere else. Like, I'm in the city. I'm, I mean, I wish I was living in some rural area with some state land adjacent to it. That would be like perfect setting for me. But isn't it? I have to drive out to get like some significant amount of food. So is it really practical? So cost of learning versus grocery, like cost of groceries for life. So like I said, um, at one point, I got about 40% of my, of my groceries by foraging. So that was the largest amount I got because I'm urban forager. There's like limited amount I can get from city. So I mostly go out. When I go out, I get there as much as I can. And then I process it, preserve it, and I eat throughout the year. So at one point, it was about 40%. And Rachel, like I said, um, my best friend, also co-owner of the business, she at one point, I believe, got... Mm, 90% of her groceries, household groceries, by foraging and gardening. I don't know if it's probably half and half foraging and gardening. But yeah, a lot of, um, so obviously you have to have coffee and you cannot forage that. And sugar, flour, salt, these, other than these, like juice maybe. Other than these, she got most of her groceries from foraging and gardening. Um, I know clay, like, I believe it's like 100%, okay except flour. <laughs> he doesn't eat sugar. But except flour, I think close to 100% of his groceries come from foraging. So it is doable. But like if you don't know anything about plants, what's edible, or not even know what, like, that looks familiar, but you know, I'll skip it. Oh yeah, flowers out, that's dandelion. You know, you're not really beyond that point. You're going to have to probably read some books, attend some classes so that you can actually identify plants with um, real plants. That's like the beginning stage, like dandelion. You, you may know purslane. You may know the apple tree when you see apples growing or cherry. Or black raspberries are quite abundant in public parks. And you may see some people picking like black caps. Or mulberry. Mulberry is kind of nuisance in city, but mulberry berries are really, really tasty. So these are like things that you may know, grow up with like, oh, my, my grandma used to collect them and made pie or something like that. That's like few minutes here and there. And then you, you read some books and you learn, say, about 10 plants each year. That puts you about 30 plants in three years. And that's a lot. Trust me, you can get a lot of food by identifying 30 plants or mushrooms. So the more you learn about plants, the more you will recognize the characteristics of a plant family. For example, mint has square stem with alternating opposite leaves, like growing like different way. And um, mustard family has flowers. There are four petals. So things like that. So you will learn to recognize the characteristics of the plant families. And that way, you can actually add much more plants than one at a time. So that way, the, that's why it's not linear. The more you learn, the quicker you can learn. And by the time three years pass, you probably can do most of medicinals. Because I really cannot think of, unless you have really serious condition or other chronic conditions, you can get most of your first aid medicine from foraging. So within three years, you will be able to get some of your groceries and probably most of your first aid medicine and some household product as well. So it depends, but. Really, I, I would say the cost is not that much for the amount of return that you get from foraging. I'm, I, again, I live in apartments, so I don't garden, but I know gardening costs quite a bit to, I mean, not really seeds, but <coughs> other things that go into growing things. So foraging 
I mean, nature takes care of all that part, so I just need to go out, identify, and pick. That's all I do. So what are some di dietary uh, considerations? So foraging is fun, but say I go out, I hike, and all I found was violet. Violet leaves are edible and flower flowers are edible. So like I got, okay, I found some like violet patch, so I got a couple handful of violet leaves in about two hours. Is it really economical? I just spent probably a good thousand calories just walking around, hiking, and I got two handful of violet leaves, which is what, like 10, 20 kilocalories? So it's all about calorie in, calorie out. If you're doing it for leisure and exercise and other, just for fun, then it's okay. It's okay to get some like small amount. But if you're doing it for major grocery foraging, like clay, like in case of clay, like 90-some 90, 90 percent of his food come from foraging, in his case, it doesn't make sense to pick violet leaves because he uses more calories than he gets from what he gather, right? So it's all about calorie in, calorie out when you're more serious about foraging. But otherwise, if you're doing it for that's fine. Um, so nutrition, carbs. A lot of foraged foods are plant, obviously, unless you're hunting as well. So carbs, good carb sources are fruits, obviously. Roots are a good carb source as well. Um, so among the fruits, Okay, acorn is nut, but botanically it's fruit, fruit of the uh, oak tree. So nuts, these are, uh, uh, eh. it has a good amount of protein compared to other fruits, but it's still, a lot of it is carb. And protein, so where do foragers get protein? Um, there is a thing called gatherer's protein. So mushrooms are a good source of protein, but it's still a lot of, a lot of a like, large portion of mushroom is water, actually. So when you dry mushroom, it just shrinks like that to nothing. So mushroom is rich in protein compared to plants, but still it's mostly water. So where do we get proteins? Nuts, a little bit, but bugs, actually. <laughs> when you get, yeah, bugs. When you get acorn, for example, there's always a weevil inside. So the weevil lays egg inside the uh, immature acorn. As the acorn matures, the bug, little wiggly thing, eats its, eat its way out. So when you gather acorn, you cannot avoid weevils. So when you get like acorn, crack it, and you'll see this little wiggly is crawling all, all, all around. But you know, if you think about it, their entire life, they only ate acorn. It's really clean protein, actually. It's not like dirty or anything. So, you know, you can just pop it in the pan with some butter and you cook it like Rice Krispie. So that's one gatherer's protein. Fishing is one way. Um, uh, what do you call it? Crawdad? Crawdaddy? What's it called? Crowded, yeah. They, they are also gatherers protein because you don't fish, but you actually gather with um, bait, right? So that's one way to gather protein. Fats. Fats are also scarce. I mean, plants are lean. <laughs> they rarely have fat. So nuts are a very important source for foragers to get some fat. Of course, if you hunt, you can get animal fat. Um, seeds tend to be rich in fat, oil. We don't call it fat. It, when it comes from plants, it's oil. Um, and water, lots of water. Plants like greens, fruits, these are rich in water. Again, mushroom has a lot of water in it too. And fiber, obviously, if you eat a lot of greens, you're going to get a lot of fibers. So we have foragers get, gathering during the summertime. And during that entire gathering, we feed people foraged food with some store, substitute with some storable food. So we eat ton of greens during that period. And in general, if you are into foraging, you will get a lot of greens like stinging nettle, um, all these garden weeds. And I'm just drawing blank, but yeah, there's a lot of greens that you can eat. Vitamin and minerals are, again, 
much higher, the content of vitamins and minerals are much higher than store-bought ones. So like phytochemical, if you think about it, the plants in the wild has to compete with other plants to survive and thrive compared to monocrops where everything is the same thing. So they don't have to compete, they just need to grow and growing is all they're doing. But the plants in the wild, they ha actually have to fight to survive, for, you know, compete with other plants around it and they have to, like animals eat them, right? So it, the plants are clever, they, they, the phytochemicals are actually plant toxins to deter all these animals that try to eat them. But we as a human take advantage of those phytochemicals and those are actually good for human body in a small dose. That's why, you. I mean, everything is good, but as long as you eat in a moderate amount, right? So vitamins and minerals, that's why vitamins and minerals are richer in wild food. And microflora, well, store-bought foods tend to be sterilized, right? But wild foods, you get all these different non-sterilized. Now, I'm not saying it's dirty or it's riddled with germs. Um, it has like yeast, benef like beneficial yeast. And sometimes if you ferment wild food, it ferments much, much better than um, store-bought food because it's like teeming with yeast and <coughs> lactobacteria. So those are microfloras we're talking about. And we're gonna talk about a little bit of a foraging season here. So Rachel always says the cardinal goes tap the tree, tap the tree in like January, uh, February-ish when it's time to tap the maple tree. Um, cardinal, I don't know, I never heard cardinal <laughs> singing like that, but that's, that's how she described it. So that's when you get the sap. When, you, uh, when I say bark, sap and bark season, I'm not talking about getting the rim of, like taking the rim out of the trunk. I'm talking like branches or twigs. That's how you get the barks. Like for example, cherry bark. You know how cough syrup is usually cherry flavored? That's because people used to make cherry syrup with cherry bark. That's why now they still carry that taste now, but there's no cherry in cough syrup anymore. So sap and bark season, and then we go into sprouts and shoots. Um, a lot of microgreens are edible. Um, there are some quote unquote grocery list in the second page. So, and I also wrote down which parts are edible and you can see like shoots, leaves, seeds. That means um, that's what the parts are edible when it's in season. So shoots, sprouts and shoots, a lot of, even like when it's mature, it's not edible, but when it's young, it's edible type of plants that there, there's a lot of them. So shoots and sprouts season. And then after that, it's generally greens until it flowers. Because the, what greens are doing is photosynthesize, put all the energy into growing, growing, like all the roots and the heights. And then eventually from there, they uh, flower. So once the flowers out, greens are mostly done. There are a small number of greens that you can still eat when the flowers are out, but once flowers are out, greens are mostly done. And once flowers are out, a lot of weedy flowers are edible, violets, dandelion, chicory, a lot of these um, garden weeds are edible flowers. Um, after flowers, we have fruits, like I said, uh, nuts and seeds are also part of the fruits, but we just call it different names. But um, fruits come in, berries are the first things come out usually, like raspberry, blackhead raspberry, and it's usually around 4th of July, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, when the berries start to come. And then the fruit season goes into seeds and nuts. Um, dandelion is like the entire plant is edible. Leaves, flowers, and roots, all edible. I'm pretty sure seeds are edible too, except who would eat that cottony seeds? So 
I, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure seeds are not going to hurt you. It's just I, I, I wouldn't put that in my mouth. So when seeds are out, the nuts are usually out too. So nuts are, again, another source of protein and uh, oil. And then after season, everything falls out. If it's not annual, then they, the energy goes back into roots and then go dormant. So that's when you want the roots, like dandelion roots, chicory roots. I know now they sell chicory roots as a um, coffee substitute. Yeah, it doesn't have caffeine. It's not coffee substitute, no. Um, but yeah, chicory roots, sassafras root is one thing that you can gather pretty much throughout, throughout the year because it's tree, actually. Um, what else? Burdock. Uh, carrot, these are all the roots that you can gather. Tubers, bulbs. Ooh, daily leaves. So this is just general guide. Not all plants follow this um, list or this season. For example, daylily. Um, do you have daylily at home? Yep, daylily is edible. Daylily flowers edible. Daily the roots are edible, and that's one of the plants that you can eat the root throughout the year. Unlike other roots that you have to wait until the flowers are gone, seeds are gone, and then you can get the root. Um, so roots, this is root season after uh, the leaves fall, flowers and seeds, everything gone. And from now until, well, when the grounds are not frozen, so until April-ish, until the next shoots and uh, sprouts come out, that's the root season. And mushrooms, I didn't talk much about mushrooms. I'm not very confident mushroom hunter, Rachel is. But yeah, I can identify a few mushrooms and eat them too. So mushrooms have its own season, like there are seasonally available mushrooms, different mushrooms, different season. And um, fish and game, again, it's part of foraging. And the, you gotta have license, but you know, if you can get your own protein, I think that's better than you know getting meats from market. To be honest, I would like to learn hunting, but I don't have time yet. But that's my goal. So, any question about foraging season? No. So now this is the front page foraging principles. So. We're talking, we're talking about starting from around your house, preferably your yard or your, or your garden. So this is mostly safety concerns when you go out. But first and foremost, when in doubt, throw it out. Just because you think, oh, that looks like dandelion. Let me taste it. Don't do that. <laughs> so if you're not 100%, well, okay, 95% sure, then don't taste it because taste is just reserve it for the <coughs> last sense to <coughs> sorry last sense to identify the plant <clears throat> so when in doubt throw it out so i always emphasize two principles safety and sustainability so safety first and then sustainability um, when you I mean, you have basic protection when you garden. You may or may not wear gloves, or you, you definitely don't go out naked in, during like hot summer because you're going to get dehydrated and whatnot. So, so basic safety, just use common sense. When you go out, say you would like to walk around public park and find out what's out there. You want to learn some plants or you know, even gather some plants. Make sure you have water on you always because when you're dehydrated, you get confused. We had the occasion once. We were out, we spread out to find mushroom. We're talking about like half mile by half mile plot. It's not large. We spread out and then we gathered. We all had water except this one couple. They came in shorts, inappropriate attire, and they, don't, they didn't have water, so what? happened was they got lost, separated from us. We, we weren't that concerned because again, it's half mile, half, by, half mile by half mile, but they ended up got stranded and they got confused. Like they freaked out. And again, they were dehydrated. So, I mean, the guy kept moving. We kept calling them and don't move, stay put. But they kept moving around and 
I, I mean, in, in, at the end, we found them, and they got some scratches here and there, but they, we were all safe. But make sure you have water on you. So that's first and foremost important thing. And insect repellent and sunscreen. Well, so mosquitoes love me. If I have 90% deed on me, they will literally hover around me right here, just waiting for it to wear out. Like, it, it's terrible. So, I mean, some insect repellents are not working very well, I guess, or it's just me that my blood is sweet, whatever. But make sure you have proper personal protection when you go out. And particularly when you go out somewhere new, that's, it's some new territory, even if it's public park, let people know where you're going, what time you're planning to return so that they can check on you when you don't. So make sure you, your phone is charged and all this safety. I mean, it's common sense, but you know, it's just one thing that you just, oh, I forgot about it. And you know, that's when things happen. So always be prepared and always be safe. And that's whistle and body system. Emergency kit is good to have on you all the time but I don't carry it on me personally, but it's always in my car. So small things like this. So location safety. So again, I'm urban forager, so I'm super aware of where I harvest what. For example, I would not gather dandelion root or chicory root, although I love chicory root. I wouldn't gather those from parking lot, for example, because car exhausts come out, they just accumulate in the soil. I wouldn't do that. Another thing is, if your house is older than, say, 1960s, 50, I believe they still use lead paint until 50s, right? So yeah, so be aware of those. Like under the windowsill is the worst. So I, I know that's where like wood sorrel love to grow, but, and yes, <laughs> right under the windowsill, that's where wood sorrel grows, but no, I don't eat them because it's growing right under the windowsill, and I know there used to be lead paint on the windowsill. So <clears throat> these are location safeties as an urban, for, urban forager that I'm aware of. So other than that, like, if you're out in the rural area, you just need to be conscious about, like, is it right next to farm field? Is it like fertilizer heavy farm or like herbicide heavy farm? Things like that and heavy metals, like I said, and create a territory, that's the most important thing. Learn your plants from yard, like start from really simple ones, wood chicory, dandelion, these are just all over. You probably can find it in your yard or garden and watch them grow throughout the year, you know, just watch their life stages. And then if you're interested in going out, start from like city park. I wouldn't recommend gathering from city park either because usually dogs go there and dogs don't have facilities like humans do. <laughs> so I wouldn't gather from, unless it's like off the ground. So I wouldn't gather from the lawn area, but just know your territory. If you know for sure dogs are coming here a lot or dogs are not allowed, Things like that, so create your own territory. Um, roadside is another thing. <sighs> Chicory loves to grow on the roadside, and unfortunately, I mean, if you drive on the road in Detroit, there are a lot of chicories growing in fall. Like you can see the pretty purple flower growing all along the road. There is like a ton of them, but that's definitely no no zone <laughs> because it's. Eh, all the exhausts and pollutants, so unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> know your targets. Like I said, when in doubt, throw it out. Plants rarely kill people because it tastes really bad when it's really bad for you, like poison hemlock. Um, you wouldn't eat it voluntarily because it tastes gross, basically. So you wouldn't eat until like you've reached to the Point where you're gonna die from that amount. So if the, it doesn't taste right, don't eat it. Don't eat it. Just because you forge something and correctly identified something doesn't mean you have to like it. Um, like I like mulberry, but I don't like blackberry. <laughs> so I don't have to like everything I forge. So that's another thing. Know your target. 
know if it's edible or poisonous or toxic, or you, you, you just simply don't like it. Um, and sustainability. If you mostly gather plants from your garden or yard, it's not much of a concern, but you know, if you go out, always aware of the fact that if it's native plant, if it's like abundant, so I would go with 40% rule. I would not take more than, if it's abundant, maybe 40%, but if it's not a lot, I would just take a nibble to taste, but I would just not touch it. So for example, trout lily, I know there are small patches here and there on Belle Isle, but it's edible, but I would not gather them because it's only small patches. So be aware of the target and just because you're so excited, don't like decimate the area, taking the entire colony. So that's the most, uh, the part that I'm most concerned about when it comes to sustainability. <clears throat> So don't over harvest and do not transport invasive species. Autumn olive is highly invasive because the birds love the seeds. They eat it and they just poop as they fly and that's where it just pops up and it's out of control. So autumn olive, it's really tasty, but do not transport plant because you just, just because you like it. Another thing is garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is really tastes the entire plant is edible, first year and second year. It is very useful. It is highly nutrient, nu nutritious, but just because it's a good plant for you, do not tr uh, transplant it to your garden if you don't have it in your garden already, don't. Just don't do that. So that's things like that. So you just need to be aware of your target. Basically learn your plants know their life cycle, what their sustainability concerns are, if it's invasive or not. So product, like I said, is invasive, but you know, in urban area, it's actually a good plant because Detroit has hard clay soil and burdock has really deep root. I mean, I don't know, four or five feet. So it actually breaks down the soil. So burdock actually does a good job in Detroit breaking down the soil, but it is actually quite invasive species. So I wouldn't recommend you to transplant it. But if you find one, it's all yours. So there are a few books and online communities, websites, and Will Forge for Food has website, willforgeforfood.com. Rachel posts what's in season blog occasionally. So what's available, she lives in Jackson area. So what's in season gives you an idea what's growing in that, in like, say in March, what she finds when she goes out in April, she finds this and that. So that way you can learn not only plants, but also which part of the plant is edible and available during that season. Um, also that's where we post our events and whatnot. So willforgeforfood.com. We also have Facebook group, same name, Willforge for Food. So if you're on Facebook, you can find us on my uh, one Facebook. Um, <clears throat> uh, I need to upgrade the books list. I believe Southfield Library, we didn't check, but <laughs> hopefully they ordered some books. I, I gave her some recommended books, so you will, if not right now, then you will soon be able to find some of the foraging books. Um, these are kind of basic uh, books for like beginners level. Uh, Sam, I highly recommend Sam Thayer's book. He now has three books and he lives in uh, Minnesota, I believe. So about 95% of the plants in his book you can find in Michigan as well, Southeast Michigan. And um, Ellen Zachos and, oh, Leda is not here, but Backyard Foraging is also, she's in New York, I believe. But backyard foraging, you can find about 90%, 95% of what's in her book in here as well. And Lisa Rose is super local. She lives in Grand Rapids and her book is more like encyclopedia. Um, Sam has 20 to 30 plants in his book, each book. And Lisa, the Mid Midwest foraging has uh, 110, 100 some plants in one book. So. Each plant has like two pages-ish. 
So that's the book you may want to get. You can find 100% of the plants in her book in this area. So if you want to get a uh, general idea of what's edible, which part is edible, um, and how to prepare those, Lisa's book is good. Um, and also, if you're interested in mushroom, 100 Edible Mushrooms by Michael Cole is the go-to book that I recommend for mushroom beginners. He has a lot of mushrooms that has no poisonous lookalikes, and you can learn a lot from that book. So that's it. And I added some common weed plants in this page. So we're going to just quickly look over. And if you recognize something or if you want to add something, just let me know. Burdock, like I said, it's edible. Chickweed is edible. Chickweed come out before snow melts, right? Yeah. Chickweed is really good um, green. It, I like using it as like microgreens, like making sandwich instead of um, other greens. I stuff it in the sandwich. So it has very mild taste. Chicory is edible. Leaves taste somewhat like dandelion. It's bitter, bitter green. Uh, common mallow is edible. Uh, I, I believe it grows in all over the lawn. Dandelion, of course. I, does anyone don't know dandelion? Great. So dandelion is a good beginner plant. The entire plant is edible. When the greens come out, during the springtime, the green tend to have milder taste before it gets bigger. So that's best time to gather them. And now is root season again. So if you can identify dandelion leaves, you know, try the root. Um, it should have a long tap root. Um, tap root is like carrot-like root. It's one long, thick root. But dandelion root is not vegetable. To me, at least, it's not vegetable. You can, uh, on the other side, there's a root tea instruction. So that's what I would do. Wash it, slice it, roast it, and use it in a tea. So dandelion root is a good place to start, I guess. I mean, it's November. So yeah, you can get the, the roots. And if you haven't foraged ever, like at all, dandelion root is a good place to start right now. And then next spring, you get the flower, I mean, greens. And then once flower comes out, you try the flower. So little by little, you can start some wild food. And daylily, like I said, shoots, roots, flowers, all edible. And now is probably root. You can, the flowers already died a few months ago. So you can get the roots, bulbs, rhizome, all parts are edible. Garlic mustard, of course, its entire plant is edible, but if you don't have it in your yard, do not transplant. Ground ivy is edible, hibiscus, juniper. Uh, juniper seeds were used, well, it, it is still used in gin flavoring. So I love, do you have juniper at home? Yeah, if you can get the seeds, um, gather some dry and then use it with the salt or other seasoning in like red meat. Gay goes with gay meat really, really well. But in general, red meat, it goes really well with red meat. And lamb's quarter, also called goose food. Um, milkweed is edible. Um, milkweed is a nuisance to farmers because once it establishes, it doesn't go anywhere. Because, uh, OK, so there's concern over monarch butterflies. They, they only eat the, the, the shoot, the top portion of the plant. So once it goes to flower and seeds, you can eat the flower and seeds when seed is really tiny. And you can eat the seeds because seed is not their main propagation method. They grow underground, the rhizome. So milkweed, once they establish, it's almost impossible to get rid of. So if you don't have it in your garden, I'm kind of torn between like, yeah, it's good to have one for butterflies, but again, if you don't want it in the future at some point, then you don't want it from the beginning. <laughs> so that's that kind of plants. Um, mint, mint is, I mean, it's general. All mint family is edible. It's all about preference because cat mint, I hate cat mint because, again, I don't have to like everything I forage. When I smell cat mint, I go, uh, it's like, uh, it, it literally gives me gagging reflex. 
So I, all, not all mints are created equal. And mulberry is edible. Oak, like I said, the acorn's edible. Oxide daisy is one of my favorite spring green. Um, I could have had some pictures go with it, but yeah, I didn't. Oxide daisy greens are almost sweet, like licorice sweet. So I highly recommend trying it if you know how to identify it uh, before it flowers. Pennycrest, pineapple weed. Pineapple weed is um, another, like oxide daisy and pineapple weeds are my favorite. Pineapple weed is related to chamomile. So a lot of flowers, edible flowers have mild sedative um, property, but pineapple weed can be used to just like chamomile for a good night sleep tea. Um, the flower's edible part. And my only problem with pineapple weed is it always grows in parking lot, always. I don't know why, but yeah. If I have a garden, that's one thing that I would put in garden. Plantain is another, uh, not the banana looking fruit, plantain. It's uh, the plant, the greens, plantain. Um, there are broadleaf plantain, narrow leaf plantain. Um, the genus name in Latin is plantago. So a lot of foragers call it plantago to avoid confusion with the banana looking fruit, plantain. Plantain is one of the things that I would put between food and medicine scale. It's almost in the middle. It can be used as food, it can be used as medicine, and it's very mild medicine. Um, purslane, I kept talking with purslane. So um, purslane comes out in July-ish, right? Yes, and it has succulent stem, and that's what gives the a bit sour taste to it. Personally, there's a bit of sour taste to it. And uh, if you make kimchi or pickle at home, uh, I recommend trying personally pickle or kimchi because it has the succulent stem. It gives good texture in the pickle. And red clover, the flowers are edible. Spruce, young tips. So when the evergreen grows in spring, there's always this very, uh, Young green, <laughs> I cannot describe the color very well. It's almost yellowish green in the spring that comes out this much tip, and then that's that year's growth. So that tip is what I'm talking about. It, so the mature leaves taste really ucky to me, but the tips have almost lemony taste to it. So young sprouts, any, any spruce tips are edible. And violet, like I said, the leaves and flowers are both edible. Wild carrot. Ah, so wild carrot is biennial, just like carrot. And the uh, Latin name is Dacus carota. And the uh, store-bought carrot is also Dacus carota. They are exactly the same species. It's just cultivated to have orange root. But, um, so the first year carrot plant is called carrot. Second year is called Queen and Slays. So it's biennial. First year, root is what's edible, and second year, you can get the seeds and flower from Quinnan's Lace. And of course, wood sorrel. Wood sorrel leaves look somewhat like, it's three leaflet, just like clover, but the leaflet itself is heart-shaped, unlike clover, which is oval shape. So wood sorrel is really easy to identify. So that's another good beginner plant. Uh, it's kind of, I, I guess it's a little too co cold, but, I have a, a pot at home, potted plant at home, and <laughs> there's wood sorrel growing it, and it's been growing for three months now, so <laughs> I don't know. I'm not green thumb, but that wood sorrel is the only thing that's surviving in that pot. I had mint in that pot, it died, but wood sorrel is still going. So yeah, that's um, what I thought you would found, find in your garden. So anything look familiar in this list? Great, so you can identify them and maybe try some next time when you see it, <coughs> right? <coughs> okay, so that's it for the presentation. If you have any question, I'll take, yes? You said something about in June, you had a gathering of the largest Yes. Collectors. What's the name of the group? Uh, <laughs> this is most important event in our business and I didn't turn blank. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, Great Lakes Foragers Gathering, yeah.
It's, uh, I believe this year it's um, June 10th to 14th, that weekend, Thursday through Sunday. And we normally have hundreds of people gathering around and we feed, um, a large portion of our meal is foraged or hunted like venison and stuff like that. So, Great Lakes Foragers Gathering. So if you go to our website, I believe the registration will go up soon so that you can get the ticket for Christmas gift and whatnot. So any, any other question? No? So the tea is probably well brewed by now. And there are jars. I left jars next to it so you can open and smell the ingredients. So is it? OK, good. <laughs> I thought it was very subtle, so I hope it brewed more. Yeah, so please have some tea. Thank you.